All right, hey everyone, and welcome back for another deep dive. You guys know how this works. You bring the fascinating topics. We bring the, well, deep dive. I like it. And um, today, we're going to be diving deep, really deep, into a concept that really makes you question everything you thought you knew about life itself. Ooh, that sounds intense. It is. It is. This is the idea of a shadow biosphere. Oh, I've heard of this. Like life, but not as we know it, right? Exactly. And we have a ton of material to get through today. Articles, research papers, even some uh, thought-provoking videos, all about the possibility of life on Earth. You're on Earth. Yeah. yeah that evolved completely separately from all the life that we know mm -hmm. and uh, and love. Wow. Like life with its own, its own origin story, its own rule book, maybe even its own separate chemistry set. That is mind-blowing. I'm ready. Let's do this deep dive. All right. Well, to help us navigate this uh, pretty complex scientific landscape, we have with us, as always, our resident expert. Welcome. Thanks for having me. It's always a thrill to delve into these mind-bending topics. And I think what's so captivating about the shadow biosphere idea is that it really challenges one of our most fundamental assumptions that all life on Earth shares a common ancestor. Right, we're talking the last universal common ancestor, or LUCA for short, right? Exactly. LUCA, the ultimate microbial ease, if you will. Yeah. This idea that all the incredible diversity of life we see today from, you know, the tiniest bacteria to the largest whales, towering redwoods to us. To us, humans. All sprung from this single ancestral organism. It's a pretty beautiful and unifying concept, this idea of a single tree of life, you know? Yeah. Everything connected. But what if, and here's where things get really trippy, what if there's another tree entirely? Another tree of life. Another tree of life. One that sprouted from a completely different seed growing right alongside ours, hidden in plain sight. Whoa. Okay. Now you're really blowing my mind here. Yeah. But how could that even be possible? I mean, where would we even begin to look for such a thing? Well, that's what we're here to figure out. And luckily, the sources you guys sent in point to some pretty wild possibilities. Okay. Lay it on me. All right. So one concept that comes up a lot is this idea of alternative biochemistry. Alternative biochemistry, okay. Yeah. So all life that we know of is based on a very specific handedness of molecules. Scientists call it chirality. Chirality. It sounds kind of like a fancy yoga pose. Maybe. Yeah. But um, in this case, we're talking about molecules. Think about it like your hands. Okay. They're mirror images of each other. Right. Both can grasp and manipulate objects. Yeah. But you can't, like, swap one for the other and expect it to work the same way. You can't put a right-hand glove on your left hand. Exactly. And molecules can be like this, too. Mm, okay. So life on Earth, like we know, uses left-handed amino acids to build proteins. Okay. And right-handed sugars for DNA and RNA. So it's like life just randomly decided to go with lefty amino acids and righty sugars early on. Like, was there a molecular coin toss back in the primordial soup? That is one of the biggest mysteries. <laughs> but the point is, there's no fundamental reason why it couldn't have gone the other way. Mm. And that's where things get really interesting, because some of our sources suggest that if life arose that was based on the opposite chirality, it might be invisible to us. Wait, hold on. Invisible. Invisible. You're saying there could be shadow life out there made of mirror image molecules existing right alongside us, and we have no idea. That's the theory. That is wild. Right. Our current methods for detecting and studying life rely on this specific handedness that we're familiar with. I see. So it's like we're trying to build with Legos, but we only have one type of brick, and the shadow biosphere is using a completely different set. And they just won't connect. It's like two entirely different sets of instructions for building life. Two separate blueprints. Okay, invisible life forms, that's a lot to process. But what about, like, where would they be hiding? Well, some of the sources, especially the work by Paul Davies, point to some pretty extreme environments where this shadow life might be hanging out. Okay, like where? Like, think scorching hydrothermal vents deep in the ocean, the freezing cold and barren landscapes of Antarctica, or even this, this bizarre thing called desert varnish. Desert varnish? What's that? Right. It's like these strange dark coatings you find on rocks in, like, really dry regions. Scientists are still scratching their heads over how it forms, and it's packed with elements like manganese and arsenic that you wouldn't normally find in such high concentrations in the surrounding rocks. So it's like some kind of microbial graffiti. Exactly. Like they're leaving us a message, but we just can't quite crack the code. And that raises another wild possibility, right? What if this shadow life isn't even using the same elements that we consider essential for life? You mean like carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, all that good stuff? Exactly. The classic CHNOPS yeah. elements. 
What if there's life out there that's based on something else entirely? Are we talking like silicon based life forms? Yeah. Like something out of Star Trek? Well, that's definitely in the realm of speculation, but it highlights a really important point. We tend to define life based on what we know. Right. But a shadow biosphere could be exploiting resources and chemistries that we haven't even considered. So the desert varnish with its weird composition could be a clue. Could be a clue that life is far stranger and more adaptable than we ever imagined. Definitely makes you wonder what else might be out there, just waiting to be discovered. Okay, so we've explored some potential hiding spots for this shadow life. Right. But how do we actually find it? Especially if it's so different that we might not even recognize it. That's the million dollar question and one that scientists are grappling with right now. Our verses highlight several different approaches, each with its own set of challenges. Lay them on me. Let's hear about these approaches. All right. Well, let's start with direct observation. Seems pretty straightforward, right? Look and see if you can find something. Right. But even with our most powerful microscopes, we're limited by what we already know. We're trying to find something that might literally defy our definition of life. Right. It's like looking for a new color when you've only ever seen shades of gray. Exactly. You wouldn't even know where to begin. Right. And even techniques like FETH, which highlight specific DNA sequences, rely on pre-existing knowledge of those sequences. It's like trying to unlock a door with a key that's designed for a completely different lock. Yeah, it just won't work. Nope. So are scientists just stumbling around in the dark here? How do you even search for something you can't define? Well, one approach is to focus on what we can cultivate. We know that the vast, vast majority of microbes are unculturable with our current methods. Mm. They need really specific conditions, specific interactions within their communities that we just haven't been able to replicate in the lab. So there's a chance that somewhere in this vast <laughs> microbial universe, a shadow biosphere could be hiding, just waiting for us to figure out the right recipe to coax it into view. It's a tantalizing possibility, isn't it? Imagine what secrets those microbes could reveal if we could just get them to grow in a lab. So we've got direct observation and cultivation. Mm. What about genetic analysis? Some of the sources talk about these like next generation sequencing techniques that are uncovering some really weird genetic material. Oh yeah, this is where things get really exciting. These new techniques are so powerful that they can analyze massive amounts of genetic material from environmental samples, and they're revealing DNA and RNA fragments that are completely unlike anything we've ever seen before. Yeah, I even read about a case where scientists were arguing about whether these bizarre sequences belong to entirely new domains of life, or if they're just artifacts of the sequencing process itself. Talk about a scientific cliffhanger. Right, and it's understandable that scientists are being cautious. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. So they're trying to fit these puzzling pieces into the existing puzzle of life. But what if they belong to a completely different puzzle? That's the challenge and the excitement of the search. Okay, so much to consider already, and we're just getting started. I'm already feeling like my brain is doing backflips. We've got invisible life, extreme environments, and genetic mysteries galore. What could possibly come next? We'll buckle up because things are about to get even wilder. We're going to dive into the implications of finding a shadow biosphere. How would it change our understanding of life itself? And what would it mean for the possibility of life beyond Earth? Whoa. Okay, hold on. My brain is still trying to process invisible life forms made of mere molecules hanging out in my backyard. Now we're going full on cosmic. We're going cosmic. Get ready for a mind expanding journey. All right, let's do it. I can't wait to see where this deep dive takes us next. But first, a quick break. Be right back. So you ready to go cosmic? I think so. Hit me. All right. So one of the sources you sent, the eerie silence. It's by Paul Davies, and he really dives deep into these mind-blowing implications of a shadow biosphere. Okay. Davies argues that if a shadow biosphere exists right here on Earth, you know, if life arose independently, not once but twice on the same planet, okay, then the odds of life emerging somewhere else in the universe, well, they suddenly become a lot more likely. Right, because if it happened twice here on our little pale blue dot, exactly. why couldn't it have happened on countless other planets out there? Precisely. Now, we're not necessarily talking about, you know, little green men or anything like that, but any kind of life, even microbial, would be a huge discovery. Right. It would completely change our understanding of, well, everything. Absolutely. It would rewrite our textbooks. Yeah. Redefine our place in the cosmos. But Davies, he also, uh, he goes to some pretty dark places with this line of thinking. Yeah, didn't he suggest that if... 
Earth is unique. Like if we're the only planet in the entire universe that managed to create life, then intelligence, the kind that builds spaceships and writes poetry and ponders the meaning of existence, might be a really rare and fragile thing. Exactly. A cosmic flicker that quickly burns out. So wait, finding a shadow biosphere, even if it's just a bunch of microscopic weirdos doing their own thing? Yeah. That would actually be a good sign for the long-term survival of intelligent life. In a way, yes, because it would suggest that life and potentially intelligence are not just flukes. They're not cosmic accidents, but potentially fundamental properties of the universe itself. Hmm. Davies argues that if we are truly alone, if intelligence is just a one-off, then it might be destined to be replaced by something else, something more resilient, more adaptable, something maybe not even biological. Like machines. <laughs> Artificial intelligence taking over and rendering us obsolete. Uh -huh. Okay, now I'm getting some serious Terminator vibes. It's a thought-provoking, if slightly unsettling idea. Yeah. But think about it this way. Finding a shadow biosphere would be like a beacon of hope, a sign that life in all its weird and wonderful forms, is not just an accident, but a fundamental part of the fabric of reality. Right. It would suggest that intelligence, too, might have more staying power than we think. So it's not just about satisfying our scientific curiosity. Nope. It's about understanding our place in the universe, mm. our potential future, maybe even our ultimate destiny. Exactly. And it raises a whole host of ethical questions as well. If we do find this shadow life, how do we interact with it? Right. What are our responsibilities to it? Yeah. And how do we prevent contamination, both theirs and ours? It's like first contact all over again. Exactly. But right here on our own planet, it makes you wonder if maybe there's a reason why this shadow biosphere, if it exists, has remained hidden for so long. Hmm. Interesting. Maybe it's a form of protection for both them and us. That's a profound thought. Perhaps we weren't ready to encounter this other form of life until now, until we develop the tools and the wisdom to approach it with respect and caution. Okay, wow. So we've gone from the microscopic world of molecules to the vastness of the cosmos and the fate of intelligence itself. It's been quite a journey. It's enough to make your head spin. I think one of the most important takeaways here is the sense of humility. Hmm. We still have so much to learn even about our own planet. Right. The very concept of a shadow biosphere really forces us to confront the limits of our knowledge and embrace the unknown. It's a humbling experience for sure to think that we've only just scratched the surface of what's possible. Exactly. And that brings us to a crucial question. How do we move forward? What specific strategies should scientists be pursuing to search for this shadow biosphere? What kind of tools and techniques do we need to develop? And what about the ethical considerations? Right. Those are essential as well. Right. We need a plan, a way to translate these mind-blowing ideas into action. Well, I'm glad you said that because our sources actually offer some pretty intriguing pathways forward. Oh, really? They do. And that's exactly what we're going to explore in the final part of our deep dive. Okay, so we've talked about how mind-blowing a shadow biosphere would be how it could rewrite our understanding of life, redefine our place in the universe, even give us clues about the future of intelligence. But uh, how do we actually find this thing? Because our sources seem to agree that our current methods just aren't going to cut it. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head there. If we're dealing with life that's fundamentally different from anything we've ever seen, our current tools and techniques, well, they might be completely blind to it. Right. It's like trying to listen to the radio using a telescope. Exactly. You're looking in the right place, but using the wrong equipment. We need to think outside the box or maybe outside the Petri dish in this case. Right. But how? What kind of out of the box thinking are we talking about? What do our sources suggest? Well, one really fascinating idea, and Paul Davies talks about this a lot, is to create artificial environments that are specifically designed to be hostile to known life. Hostile to life. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like we're talking about recreating those extreme conditions we discussed earlier, you know, like those deep sea vents or the desert varnish. Sorry. And then we introduce samples from these environments and see if anything survives or even thrives. So basically, we're building a microbial obstacle course. Exactly. Only the truly weird and wonderful will make it to the finish line. I love it. Yeah. But wouldn't actually designing these environments be incredibly difficult? I mean, how could we possibly create something that's hostile to 
every single form of life we know. It would be a huge challenge, no doubt about it, but we do already have the technology to simulate those extreme temperatures, pressures, chemical composition. Okay. It's a matter of combining these tools in really creative ways, creating a selective pressure that favors those life forms that operate on different principles. The ones that don't play by our rules. Exactly. Okay, so extreme environments are one approach. What else? What other strategies are out there? Well, refining our genetic analysis techniques is another promising avenue. Right. We talked about those next generation sequencing methods. Exactly. Those methods are already uncovering all sorts of weird and challenging genetic sequences. Yeah. The key now is to develop ways to analyze these sequences without relying on comparisons to known life. So instead of asking, does this look like anything we've seen before? Right. We need to ask, what are the fundamental principles at play here? Exactly. It's like learning a new language, you know? Mm. Instead of trying to translate this alien genetic code into the language of familiar biology, we need to decipher its own unique vocabulary and grammar. So we need to figure out how to read the book of shadow life. Exactly. And that means developing new algorithms, new computational tools, new ways of thinking about information storage and transfer in biological systems. Wow, that sounds like a tall order. Yeah. So we've got extreme environments, cutting edge genetic analysis, anything else? Well, some researchers are proposing a more indirect approach. Instead of looking for specific molecules or genes, they suggest focusing on what they call the biosignatures of shadow life. Biosignatures. Yeah, so these are like unusual patterns in the distribution of elements or isotopes okay. that could indicate the presence of unfamiliar metabolic processes. So it's less about finding a specific molecule and more about recognizing a distinct chemical fingerprint. Precisely. Okay, I get it. So like if you walked into a bakery and smelled a cake made entirely of seaweed and dirt, okay. you wouldn't need to see the recipe to know that something really strange was going on in that kitchen. That's a perfect analogy. And this approach could be applied to both exploration here on Earth and the search for life on other planets. So we're widening the net looking for any sign of life that might not fit our current definitions. Exactly. Really expanding our horizons. Okay, well, we've covered some truly mind-blowing strategies for finding a shadow biosphere. But before we wrap up, I have to ask, what about the ethics of all of this? If we do find shadow life, how do we make sure we don't harm it? How do we make sure our curiosity doesn't lead to unintended consequences? Those are essential questions, and it really highlights the need for a much broader conversation. We need to bring in ethicists, philosophers, social scientists, policymakers, everyone who has a stake in shaping how we interact with the world around us. This isn't just about scientific discovery. It's about responsibility and stewardship. Absolutely. If we're going to open this door to a potentially new form of life, we need to do it with the utmost care and respect. Couldn't agree more. We need to think about the potential for contamination both ways, protecting the shadow life from our microbes and vice versa. Think about the implications for how we see ourselves in the universe. Yeah. And we need a plan for how to communicate these discoveries to the public. Do it in a way that fosters understanding, avoids unnecessary fear or sensationalism. Wow. Well, it's clear that this conversation is just getting started. We've only scratched the surface of this incredible topic. Absolutely. It's a journey into the unknown filled with challenges and possibilities. Yeah. And it's a journey we need to take with both scientific rigor and a sense of wonder. I couldn't have said it better myself. This search for a shadow biosphere is a testament to human curiosity and our desire to understand the world around us. Who knows what incredible discoveries await us in this unexplored realm of life. It really makes you question everything you thought you knew. To all our listeners, if this deep dive has sparked your curiosity, keep exploring. Dive into the sources we discussed, read more about the research, and please share your thoughts and questions with us. The Search for a Shadow Biosphere is a collective endeavor, and we're all in this together. Thanks for joining us on this incredible journey on the deep dive.